something about just 
There's something about honoring and focusing on Jesus. To the point that he said, whether two or three of you are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of you. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we humble ourselves and we yield to you because you are so worthy to have everything. Amen? Amen. We're going to jump straight into the announcements. And... Uh, got some awesome stuff tonight. Hey guys, it's Melissa here. Welcome to church. We're so excited you're here. Whether you're joining us in person or if you're online, make sure you leave a comment below. Here are some upcoming events. Join us May 17th, 24th, and 31st for our Wednesday night in-person services at 7 p.m. This is an amazing time for us to come together as a community, worship in God's presence, and receive an awesome word from our pastors. Then join us Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. PST for our Sunday service live stream. On Tuesday nights, join us for our worship night live stream at 7 p.m. PST on our YouTube channel. Do you have a sense of God's significance and calling over your life, but are not sure how to get from where you are today to a place of preparation and then into the positioning of your calling? I want to invite you to join me at Legacy Academy on June 22 through 24. Thursday and Friday will be evening, so you can still have your job and go to work. And then Saturday, the 24th, will be a full day. I've made it extremely affordable for you. There is so much value that you're gonna get out of this. It will be a time of impartation, teaching, and equipping where I give you keys to not only move towards your significance, but to have longevity in your journey. God bless you and I hope to see you there. God bless. And that's what we have going on. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube so you can stay up to date. And from all of us here at Dwelling Place, Welcome home. Hi everyone, welcome home. You guys ready to give to God? This is probably one of my favorite things that we do as a, as a church is we talk about giving because as humans, we need to be constantly reminded <laughs> to give back to our creator. Um, so I wanna read a, a quick scripture to you that uh, God was speaking to me about this week. And I think uh, we've heard it before, but it's a good one, especially around this time of year. You know, it's like tax time. You guys know what that's like, right? We've got to pay our taxes or file our tax return and get money back from the government where you gave them too much. That's a nice one. Um, but here in Mark 12, uh, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and actually the Pharisees come to him and try to test him about whether they should give to uh, Caesar, right? And uh, Jesus says this, uh, or, or it says here, uh, and they came to him and said, teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. So they're baiting him with uh, some flattery. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or do we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to him, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Uh, this scripture has always spoken to me uh, for years, but something that I think is really awesome around this time and I want to share about is um, that we often treat uh, God and giving like we do the IRS. Um, and, you know, when you have a business or even as not, you get to deduct some of your expenses from what you owe the government. But sometimes we do that to God. And we try to deduct, well, I did this and I gave that and I was on, you know, I did this here or there or I had this come up and this come up. And we find all these ways to itemize our, how we don't have to give back to God. How we can, you know, restrain ourselves from giving to him and sowing to him because, oh, well, this expense came up here. Or, uh, you know, actually, I, I bought my pastor a coffee this week, so I'm going to deduct that $5.75. Oh, wait, no, they add, it's now six fifty because of inflation. I'm going to deduct that from what I owe to God. I, I'm convinced that if I was around back then, none of the disciples would have fallen asleep because I would have bought them too much coffee. Because um, it's like probably its own love language. But, but honestly, like, 
we should be living in a place of, of, of constant generosity wherever we're at. And it doesn't mean that you have to give, ev like, oh I, oh, I can't afford to buy $7 lattes. That's okay. You don't have to. But you can be generous in your heart. You can be generous in your actions. You can hold the door open. All that stuff's important. But then we come into the house and we say, okay, well, you know, I made a X amount of dollars this month, and so if I multiply that times, you know, 0 0.10, that tells me that I should give this amount, but I'll deduct this and this and this, and so, you know, God, I'm actually going to give you 80%, or maybe 9.99% of what we should give, but actually, we should be giving to God without restraint. We should be giving to God even above what, what He's asked for, because that's actually the Old Testament, the Old Covenant is the 10%, the tithe, and I've been reading just about Melchizedek and Abraham who gave to Melchizedek when there was no rule, there was no law even to do it, just out of honor, and that Jesus came in the order of Melchizedek, someone without lineage, without end, and we're to give to Jesus, we're to give to God in the same way that Abraham did, which is in faith. So faith is required in our giving. But, but something here that I think is beautiful, and I just, I've always marveled at it, and I think it's amazing, is on, on the coin was Caesar's face. So Caesar rendered in his likeness a, a something, a, a metal face of himself. So give that back to him. But we are made in God's image. So when Jesus says, render to God what is God's, he's saying, look at yourself. You were made in the image of God. Give yourself to God and all that you have. So he's literally saying, hey, actually, you, yourself, the whole thing, which includes your bank account, which includes your, or back then, probably like their little like pouches. They probably had like little gold pouches that like swung around and made noise. And that's how rich you were. Uh, and you know someone was faking it for sure, but, um, but I'll say this, is that God was saying all of you, everything that's yours is actually belongs to the kings. So when we give, why do we give with restraint? Why do we look to itemize our deductions and treat it like the IRS and treat it like, you know, we're giving to the treasury of a, of a mortal government? We're not. And it literally talks about this later in the, in the scripture. It's amazing. In the same chapter, the widow's offering, which I think Pastor Andrew preached on a couple weeks ago in the offering, but says that he sat down opposite the treasury and watched what the people watched the people putting money into it. And I just thought it's so interesting that he uses the word treasury, because that's what we think of in, you know, the secretary of the treasury or the IRS or these things. We give money to our government to facilitate things, but we're actually a part of a heavenly government. And there's actually, it's not that God needs our money, but he does need our money, because there, we live in a real world, a tangible place. And you do need to give. And not to us, not to this church. You need to give to God so that God can do what God needs to do in the earth. Because, you know, and, and he owns a cattle on a thousand hills, but hey, you know, the world is changing and finances are, are falling apart for people and people need help and the church is actually set up by God to help people. Help them spiritually, help them in, in their life and their day-to-day -day and everything else. And there was a time in my life when I definitely deducted every single thing that I could from what I needed to give to God. <laughs> but something shifted when I started coming to Dwelling Place when I first came, one of the guys that was here he had sat down with me and he's like, you've got a spirit of poverty. And I was like, what? What the heck? What's that? That sounds bad. I don't know if I believe in spirits, but if they are there, then that sounds bad. I don't want that. And he said, you, you, you believe that God doesn't want to bless you. And so you're actually, you spend what you have. You don't use your money wisely. You don't give because you're afraid that you're going to lose what you have, but you're not supposed to be afraid. You're not supposed to be afraid. So I want to finish with this is that, um, you know, at the end, just like he did in the beginning when he called the disciples, at, at the end, he finds them back at their old jobs fishing, remember? And they throw the nets over the water, and they're not catching anything. And then Jesus from the beach, but it's not Jesus because it doesn't look like Jesus, and they don't recognize him, but they should have figured it out right away. It was like, hey, cast them on the other side. That should, that should have been their first tell, like figure it out. Hey, no one else in history has ever said that except for Jesus. And he said it to me last time, and I caught a lot of fish. But they did the exact same action they were doing before, but they did it in faith. And so I want to share with you that you may be sowing. You may be even sowing faithfully, but not in faith. You may, be, you may be obedient in your giving, but not actually believing in your giving. And so tonight, we're going to believe in our giving. How does that sound? Okay? All right. So um, if you, if you want to give, you can give online. If you, if you do need an envelope, I think there's a couple people that like to do that. Um, Jabo will bring you a, an, an envelope. Uh, but you can give online. The, the information's on the screen or text. Uh, but we're going to sow in faith for this next season of what God's doing in this community, in this church, in this territory, and in this nation. Does that sound good? All right. So grab your phones if you gave online or if you gave before. And let me just say this too. If you already gave and you feel like you didn't give in obedience or in, in faith, give just a little more, just something. 
Just something in faith. It, it can be a mustard seed. It doesn't have to be a lot, but in faith that God can turn your life around. He can change your situation. He can change your circumstances. He can cancel that debt. He can pay that bill. He can, you know, reduce whatever this is. He can get you a better tax refund. He can do it. God can do it, okay? So let's just pray. Jesus, we just honor you right now, and we give you right now what, what's inscribed on us, which is you. We give you ourselves, and we give you everything that we have. We trust you with this, and we ask right now that you would bless our giving as we give it to you. We ask that you would honor our giving, that you would honor our seeds, and that you would water the seeds that we've sown before, that you wouldn't forget about them. We remind you of those, and we say, no, we want some more. We need some more seed in the ground. So we trust you, Jesus, with our tithes and our offerings. We trust you, Father, and we thank you that you are raining down on us, that you send rain across the land to provide for us, and we ask that you would rebuke the devourer over us in Jesus' name, that you would rebu rebuke every single thing that would try to take from us, steal from us, that would, and, and that you would help us to reap a hundredfold in, in a season of famine. When the world is crumbling, we don't have to crumble because we're in faith and we believe in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Awesome. Pastor Andrew? Okay, so before we go any further, uh, we want to, I understand it's Wednesday night and this weekend is Mother's Day. We want to honor mothers because it's Mother's Day this weekend and obviously we, we are going to be, um, this obviously gets broadcast on a weekend and so it's Wednesday night right now. For those of you that don't know online, this was previously recorded. Um, I'm also, we're working on getting this new headpiece um, running. We've got a new uh, pack for it. So if it's a little scratchy here and there, just give us some grace tonight. We're just, we're trying to get it uh, fine-tuned and dialed in. So anyways, we'll get there. Mothers, the backbone of the house, the nurturer of the family, the, the, the delicate touch to a pretty difficult world at times that brings security and nurture and love and fostering. And so we, we want to we honor mothers. I, I just want to say, because we have a particular bent against the religious spirit in this area that has diminished women in the church. If you uh, remember, I preached a message last year on women can preach. And I stand behind that message, and I will for the rest of my life. And all you haters, Jesus bless you and bring you the spirit of revelation. I mean, Paul needed a spirit of revelation. He was persecuting people that God was using. And he thought that his the theological doctrine was correct. And he had to have an encounter with Jesus himself. And I think he was moments away from being struck down dead, but he bowed the right way. And so I think that that's actually the case where there is an anti-woman thing because we know that the devil was told in the garden that there would be enmity between him and the woman. Not just the seed, but the woman. And so, unfortunately, in the world we live in today, there is an unhealthy escalation of feminism that is, on a lot of levels, trying to present as an independent powerhouse. And that is actually not true. We honor women and mothers for who they are within the family unit. You can't be independent of the family unit and have that motherhood value authentically. And, you know, the, the very, very demonic attack, I'm just going to say some stuff right now because we're on the subject. And you know me, I can't resist a good fight. Uh, so the demonic attack is that, that the devil has actually used the, the feminine movement to now empower non-genetic women to be classed as mothers. And that actually, as we know, is now starting to have a very net opposite effect of what people thought it initially was going to look like. And so we are here today to honor biological mothers. Yes. Because, well, I'll just leave it at that, shall I, before, before we have to edit it. <laughs> But look, I, I just want to say this, that the Word of God, when He was brought into the world, required the womb of a willing woman to become a mother. 
And Mary, although we do not worship her, became the first carrier of the tangible gospel within her being. Now, we all get to, male and female, get to carry that gospel within us. But it took a willing mother, even Elizabeth, John's mother, every mother that's ever carried Samuel's mother, that has been willing to carry and house a life. You see, the way that we see it is that motherhood is not mere birthing. It is. It's, it's conception. It's the, the, uh, the, the pregnancy. It's the birthing. But it is the nurture, the raising, the fostering, the guidance, the discipline, the love, the prayers. How many of you have been chased down by mother and grandmother's prayers? That's a fact. Women's prayers have changed the world. Mothers who have watched over their seed have changed the world. While they may not have stood on battlefields, they stood on their knees before the throne of heaven, and those prayers have changed the world. So mothers are not merely defined just in pregnancy, although pregnancy is a definite indicator. But... But motherhood is not merely defined exclusively in pregnancy, but in the life's task of guiding their sons and daughters to a path that would please God. And if you find yourself as a mother today and your children aren't serving God, I've got got some news for you. Jesus is still on the throne and he's still listening to your prayers. And for those of you that raised your children to know Jesus, the Bible, I just want to speak to you for a minute. And we have some gifts that we're going to have the kids bring in just a second. But I just want to encourage you because sometimes when our sons and daughters stray from the, from the kingdom, it can be a very, very defeating, discouraging, disparaging experience because in most cases, people will connect their success to the trajectory of their children. But I have a little promise for you that the Lord gave me many, many years ago. And he said, the scripture that says, raise your children in the way they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. And the Holy Spirit came to me once as I was ministering, actually to my own family, back home. I heard the Holy Spirit so clearly say, but that doesn't mean that there won't be some bumps in the middle. And so if you've raised your children in the way they should go, there is a tangible spiritual promise partnered and required with your prayer and their ultimate conceding that they will come back to what they were raised to walk in. But that requires a mother to stand watch in the prayer room and go to war with every force that's coming against the destiny and trajectory of your sons and daughters. And maybe your womb is closed and you haven't had children yet or you haven't been able to have children. Become a mother of a generation. Use your prayers today instead of mourning what hasn't happened in your life to pray over sons and daughters that God is looking for. For every prodigal, you can start to pray and intercede. See, motherhood, in this sense, spiritually now I'm talking about, is something you can take a hold of. See, I fathered young men discipling before I ever became a biological father. Stop waiting for permission and start praying. So so tonight, today, we honor mothers here in this room and uh, everywhere that you're you're watching this, this service, and we honor you. We honor the institution of marriage between a man and a woman that God ordained that no one can move the boundary. No matter what billboard you put up, no matter how you change dictionaries, you will never defy the boundaries that our king has set out. You cannot. That's just deception. You can change laws and rules and times just like Xerxes did, but that doesn't mean you change eternity. 
and that doesn't mean you change creation. And so we, we salute and honor everyone that has been gifted and entrusted with motherhood and everyone that is yet to be. Come on. Some of you just need to get your hand out into the atmosphere of destiny and say, you know what, I really, I know some of you women in the room and on, watching online, you're like, I'm not married yet and I desperately want to be married. Well, guess what? There's probably a Samuel coming from you, if you understand the story. So let's get a hold of God. So we honor mothers tonight. Jesus' name. Okay, kids, why don't we bring all of the, if every mother in the room can stand, I want to pray a blessing. Kids, come stand with me. Okay. You see all these mothers out here? Mummies and grandmummies and great grandmummies. Have at it, kids. <laughs> and you say, bless you in Jesus' name. Oh, what was that? Oh. Okay. Pearl of great price just took a run. <laughs> Someone's got to sell everything. Go get it. Okay. Every mother... We honor you in Jesus' name. We speak life. We speak blessing. We speak breakthrough. Now, I think we've got enough plants. I, while we're doing this, just for a second, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just get weird for a minute. Okay, all the, all the biological mothers, just take a seat for a moment. I'm going to call you back in a second. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to humble yourself here for a minute. Every woman in this room that, that has, a, has a heart and a desire to become a mother, whether you're married or not, doesn't matter. I want you to stand to your feet. Okay, kids, grab some more. We're, gonna, we're having an act before God right now, okay? Because we're seeding the destiny of your life. We're seeding the future. Okay. We're going to prophetically give these to each of these, each of these ladies standing up, kids, because these ladies want to become mummies. And as, as you receive these plants, I want you to receive, as it were, the tangible promise of God that God hasn't forgotten you, you haven't been left out, your story is not over, we are not conceding with a grave, we are not conceding with some kind of being left out, we are taking hold of a promise that God has called us, and in between then and now, we're going to be faithful with the kingdom, and we are going to pray and foster and mother people in the kingdom and a generation that doesn't have hope yet. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Has everyone got one? Anyone doesn't have one yet, please raise your hands. Oh, we've got in the back. Kids, there's up in the back. Get after it. There's like two or three of them. We got any more plants? Okay, we got this, Benjamin. If, if anyone's left out, we'll get you a little, we'll get you a little prophetic promise. Okay, so... So everyone stand up that, that has received a potted plant or should have received a potted plant, and we're going to pray. I've never done this before, but I just felt really led by the Spirit of God to do this tonight, okay? So there's, there's a place here for you, and there's a promise here of God. The, the way you inherit, and I'm speaking to both mothers and hopeful mothers, the ones that are going to be future, we'll call you future mothers, not hopeful mothers. The way that you receive a promise of God is you latch on to a vision and a promise and you never, ever let go. You never concede with doubt. You never concede with emotional grief. You never let the enemy wear you out to the point where you say it's never going to happen. You never, ever let that come out your mouth. Whether you're praying over children that have walked from God, whether you're still waiting to be married and you're really hoping and believing and dreaming with all your heart that, that you've been called to be a mother because it's just burning in you. We are going to lay hold of promises right now to the mothers that are raising children in this room that have potential and vision, to the ones that have strayed. We are, the mothers in this room are the powerhouse prayer bringers, prayer warriors, the ones that bring nurture, the ones that bring care, the ones that lay their lives down so recklessly and generously so that others may flourish. So right now, Father, I just thank you for the gift of mothers to this house and to the families and to the future families, to this generation, that, God, you would seed in us the hearts of mothers, that you would cause, Father, your promises to burn bright in our hearts, that where we feel weak, that you would lift us up, the days we feel like we have nothing left to give, that you would be the energy renewing, 
you would rejuvenate our hearts and spirits. For those of us that feel like we're running out of hope and vision and promise and, and just it's just been difficult, that you would renew our faith, that you would cause our vision to be renewed and our hope to soar, and that you would cause us, God, to reap the things that we have been believing you for. That you would bless the mothers in this room and bless the future mothers. That you would cause, Father, their prayers to be effective for the blessing of your hand to flourish over their lives and for the things that they've been praying over God to be realized. I pray you'd bless their hearts with, with special intimacy, promise, vision, insight, encouragement, that you would show them how valuable they are to you as they steward their little corner of your world. So we bless them tonight as a house in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Now, I also have uh, Pastor Bex. You want to you wanna come out here? And uh, kids, we got some more. We just, I just want to take a special moment to honor the mother of this house. She has been... Love you. She has been faithful. And that's right. Let's give honor here. That's right. We're a house of honor. Good job, kids. You can bring those flowers out. I just want to... The thing is, is that a lot of the times, it's very much like a biological mother. Good job, kids. Wow. Chocolates and flowers and cards. Good job. We love you, and we're so grateful for you. Um, the, the thing is, is that, you know, Pastor Bex is a mother herself, homeschooling and raising three children, and sometimes people can't get to her, and they get upset with that, but you don't realize just how much work goes into her life behind the scenes. She's trying to write an album to worship the Lord right now. But the commitment that this young lady has had behind the scenes, the sacrifice she's had, a lot of the times, that's the part that most people don't see. And so we just take a moment to honor you and we just speak the blessing of heaven over you, yeah. that God would honor your heart, yeah. that he would nurture you, that he would satisfy you with the things and the desires of your heart as you have put him first and you've honored his house. We bless you and we are grateful to heaven for the gift of Pastor Bex yeah. over our lives in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you. Love you. You know, as Jesus was dying, I want you to capture that for a minute. As Jesus was dying, he walked in so much honor that he made sure his mother was taken care of. We could learn something in our generation. Okay, we good? Is there anything else I need to cover, or can I jump into the message? I just, there's so, been so many moving parts, I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. I, I've been up since 1.30 a.m. this morning as I flew back from Florida today. So, help me, Jesus. Okay, you guys good? Uh, the message I'm going to speak and share with you tonight is called Looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. Got your Bibles? You want to turn with me, please, to the book of Numbers, chapter 21. And I'm going to read a little bit of a backstory here for a second. <coughs> Looking to Jesus. <clears throat> Numbers 21. I'm going to read from verse 1. And the king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road Atherim. Uh, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. The enemy heard you were coming. And so he fought against you and he took some of your prisoners. Don't you just hate that? I do. So Israel made a vow to the Lord. Now, vows are cheap today, but vows to God are very serious to the point that the Scripture actually warns us, do not vow something to the Lord that you're not going to deliver because it is a sacred covenant oath and it matters to God. You do not make a vow and think you can break your word like most Californians do on lunch appointments. No, no, for real. Oh, I had a better offer come up. 
No, no, it does not work like that with God. When you say something to God, you better show up and deliver. Like, it's, that's, for me personally, I've learned, I've learned better than to do that. So I'm just helping anyone, if you think that's not a thing, it's a thing. It did not die when the Old Testament was finished writing. It is very much alive today. Okay. Woo! That one dropped like a lead bomb. I, I just, you probably could call me the lead bomb apostle. I mean, <laughs> at this point, you know, lead balloon, whatever. Okay. They made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. This is Israel speaking to God. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they, were utterly, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. They made good on their promise. So the name of that place was called Horm- Horma. I don't like that name. But anyways. <laughs> so, so that's the backstory. Now, the reason I'm reading a little bit of the backstory here is it's really interesting to study the yo-yo relationship that Israel had with God. Yo-yo relationship. Do you know that most people mess up right after God's delivered them and done something really great? Most people mess up when God has brought breakthrough because they just sit back and go, you know what, things are pretty good right now. They let their guard down and they start doing things that they should have never done. So let's keep reading. Verse 4. Then they journeyed to the Mount... Mount Hor, by the way of the Red Sea. That's a dead giveaway right there. To go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Now, that's interesting because now you've got to go to this difficult journey after God's just had massive breakthrough in your life. you're, You're progressing into what God's told you to walk in, but the enemy has showed up and he started to deplete your forces You made a vow with God. God came through. You got breakthrough. And what happens next? You carry on your journey and you start getting discouraged. How does that happen? It happens when we forget what God has already done. And we assess our success by our present moment, comfort, progress, whatever. Well, it hasn't happened yet, so God hasn't been good to me. And the devil's like, yeah, you know what? I feel that too. Look. Let's, let's trauma bond. Jeez. <laughs> oh, okay, you with me? Okay. So they got discouraged on the way, and the people spoke. What? Listen to this. This is really important. The people spoke against God and against Moses. This is classic human beings right here. God was good to us, but now it's difficult. Let's blame someone. I know. We'll blame leadership. This is, this is human nature. This is not dwelling place. This is human nature. Let's blame someone. It was this woman you gave me, God. It was this snake, God. It just goes right back to the beginning. No, it wasn't just the woman's fault. It was the woman you gave me. It's your fault, God. You gave me this woman. Hello? Is someone someone tracking right now? So we blame leadership and God. Hello? See, this this right here is the behavior that war... I've thought about this a lot because you see this whole thing, you know, Charlton Heston, the Ten Commandments. I remember growing up watching that reel to reel when I was a kid. You know, just like Charlton Heston standing there in his little red tunic. And he's got his rocks. He says, if you will not live by the law, you will die by the law. And he throws it down. There's an earthquake and people start dying. And you know what I'm talking about. And you just see it's like, dude, this guy's just angry. And then everyone's ticked off and is like, well, you brought us here to die. We, have, we can't even drink. We're all about to die. And God's like, just speak to the rock. And he's like, <laughs> smashes it with his rod a couple of times. And God's like, now Moses. Can't go into the promised land. You know the one that you told everyone about? The one that that Abraham was promised, but you were the one that was sent to bring? Yeah, you don't get to go now because they drove you crazy and you responded bad. 
people drove him crazy because they were blaming God and leadership. And he broke. But no one blamed the people. But the people all died in the desert. But Moses got the consequence of people wearing him out. This is just really important to understand because human nature never changes. It's just there throughout history. You could blame all kinds of politicians, but you voted them in. Or well, they voted themselves in through... Anyway, so I'll leave... <laughs> Woo! Shake and bake. Anyways. <laughs> having fun here. Having fun. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. So the people spoke against God and against Moses, and they said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? This, this mind boggles me, because if you look at the ten plagues in Egypt... And I've talked about this before, so I'm not going to sit on it too long. If God shows up in your world and rains fireballs, be quiet if it gets tough. <laughs> he just showed you he's got fireballs. He shows you he's got an army of frogs. He showed you that he kills all the firstborn that comes against you. Like, that's serious stuff. He shows you that he parts the Red Sea. That's not even one of the ten plagues. He's got a pillar of fire stopping your enemies while you walk through dry land that should have been soggy ground. Way under the sea that gets parted. Which wasn't some strange breeze that blew over a small, thin, shallow section. You don't drown a whole army of able-bodied warriors and chariots and two feet of water, guys, when it goes back together. Come on, let's be smart here. It was serious water depth. This was a phenomenal miracle. When you've got, and all these people walk, live this. This is not a different set of people. This is the same people grumbling against Moses. Grumbling against God. You guys tracking here? We also need to latch on to this because it's easy to go, oh, it's Old Testament, Chal Charlton Heston stuff. But this is human nature. It never changes. Hello? Because sin is still re resident. Yeah. yeah, Adam never blamed Eve until he ate the fruit and he fell. The second sin came in, he became a blame shifter. And he became a persecutor of authority. That's what sin does. It claims oppression and blames authority. Just want to throw it out there. Just throwing it out there. Okay, we'll leave it right there. Do, do, do. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no water. There is no food. And our soul loathes this worthless bread. Oh, you mean the bread that materializes out of nothing called manna that falls on the ground every morning that you wouldn't have eaten if God hadn't have given to you supernaturally? You loathe the provision of God now? You'd rather the luxury of the food in slavery than the meagerness of freedom in a desert while you transition in a season. I'm speaking to somebody right now. Woo! You want luxury in chains. You want comfort while you're ruled. Not some cost while you transition. Oh, man. Speaking to some body. Okay, so why have you brought us here um, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food, there is no water. Our soul loathes this worthless bread. Not only do we say we don't like it, we say this is garbage. This is worthless. Can you imagine saying that to God? Like of all the things to screw up in, you take a miracle that shouldn't happen where food just lines the ground every day when you wake up and God's got food for you. Of all the things to screw up in, you're screwing up and saying, God, what you're giving me is worthless. God, where you put me is worthless. Who you gave me to do life with is worthless. The, the finances I've got in my life now is worthless. It's not enough, God. Which means you're worthless if you're the worthless giver. That's them saying you're worthless because you don't know how to take care of us. This is insult 101, no go, right here. You do not go down this road. Okay, so let's keep reading. 
I mean, th- this is just like watching someone committing suicide. It's that level of stupidity. No, no, literally, this is it. you're literally going up against the God that just drowned all your enemies just months before. He decimated every, all of your oppressors, and now you are flipping him off. I, just some, I want us to get this in context as I read through here because you need to understand the context of where this is going because this is how broken humanity can be sometimes. Okay, someone getting something tonight? Just a good filter to be reading through, huh? So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. Isn't it amazing that God didn't send a warning shot? You believe you deserve a warning shot. But you crossed a lot of consciences to get to the point where you're making these statements. You crossed a lot of inner checks to get to the point of arrogance and just complete disregard where you're flipping God off. God did not say to Moses, hey, tell people to calm down. I don't want this to go bad for them. God's first shot over the bow was serpents that were like taking people out. Oh, we're under the cross now. Well, let's go to Acts chapter 5 and talk about the people that lied to the Holy Spirit. They didn't get a warning shot. That's New Testament, blood of Jesus, ascended son, resurrected Lord, the Spirit, Holy Spirit was there, grace and mercy was flowing, and people were lying to the Holy Spirit by telling pe- lies to Peter, and they're dropping dead. So let's just get context here, because some of our modern teaching has not been honest with us. Like, you know, I was thinking about the other day, and I just kind of talked to God, and I said, how are you, I was having a, one of my weird, deep conversations with God. I was like, how are you going to psychologically deal with watching millions of people come stand before you and them getting cast out. God, who loves everybody, Jesus, I, I believe Jesus at the cross died for every single person, whether they accepted him or not. That's my personal belief. He is going to look at most of his creation and say, depart from me. And the brutality of that moment is going to be severe. Don't you tell me that you got God profiled as a little lamb. That is a very, for me, personally, it's a very sobering moment. To stop and think about that. To put myself in his place where I'm seeing through his eyes for just a moment and I'm seeing people that I loved, that I created, that came and stood before me. Depart from me. That is the same Jesus that you worship. That's why we need to be on the right side of him. See, the fear of the Lord is really the beginning of all wisdom because it'll help you to not become the idiot that says, look at this worthless provision you gave me, God. Hello? I want to be on the right side of this Jesus. Hello? not trying to freak you out, because he is full of mercy, compassion, and grace. But there is a side to him that you do not want to get on that side of. Okay. And there's so much grace for us, guys. It's just good for us to hear this once in a while that this is in his wheelhouse. He does have a fireball arsenal. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> okay, so, so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. That's the response. You complain, you die. You don't like the soup? <laughs> Check out the reptiles. Second course. <coughs> Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned. Yeah, that's a really good place to be. I made a mistake. I really messed up. We're dying. Because the wages of sin is death. You're already being told that, so you don't need a warning shot. You can violently riot in this country and berate all kinds of leadership on earth. You cannot do that in heaven. You cannot. It doesn't work like that. Jesus, who paid the ultimate price, is not to be mocked. Hello, there is grace, especially for people that haven't, understood this but as you get more and more understanding of who he is and how great his sacrifice was and the 
the, the price he paid and all of this and how beautiful he is, how merciful he has been to me, how much grace I've personally received, we start getting revelation of how much he should be honored. Remember Mary Magdalene? The, the, uh, the, the town prostitute probably slept with most of the men in town and anyone that came through. Like, that's just a reality. I'm sorry to be so graphic. That's just a reality. This woman was torn up. She was beat up. She, she had had a rough life. Psychologically, she was probably tr- like very devastated. And she finds this man who treats her with dignity for the first time because every other man she'd ever met took from her. But Jesus looked at her, and yes, she was sinful. Because you can blame men all you want, but you participated in it. Blame culture. But Jesus took nothing from her. There was no lust, no guile, no perversion in him. And he showed her dignity and honor. And she found worth for the first time in her life. And so she wept at his feet and anointed his feet with her tears. And the disciples were like, this is ridiculous. This is an unclean woman. And Jesus was like, no, no. To the one who's forgiven much, loves much. Well, let, let me say it like this. The one who's discovered the mercy of God shows great honor. Protects his name, honors his name, reverences him, finds out what pleases him and does it, finds out what displeases him and runs far from it. Hello. I just, I'm try, trying to get us to get some perspective because sometimes when we read Old Testament, it's hard to bring it and amplify it into our personal lives today. But I need to do that so we can, we can understand. I, I need to keep moving here. Someone catching something tonight? So the people did the first thing right in a while. They said, we've sinned and we've spoken against... Um, sorry, I just lost my place. We have sinned. We've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. A real leader that gets abused by people and prays for those people is a good leader. That's a good leader. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who was bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, and I think this thing was significant, because you don't make this tiny little thing at a camp of one to three million people. If, you know, Jethro gets bitten way out in the back ranks of the camp, and he can't see the snake, well, too bad, I guess he dies. (laughs) So this thing was probably (laughs) sizable. Well, too bad, I guess he's going to be with Jesus. (laughs) Bad eyesight, you know. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, where the people have no vision, they perish. So, <laughs> they didn't have spec savers back then. You know what I mean? So, th- so, this thing was probably significant, and they put this big brazen serpent, and they raised it up in the middle of the camp. Now, to me, it's always been intriguing that God would have Moses make a snake, the image of what was killing them, to be the focal point of faith. But when they looked to this thing out of a place of obedience, healing was made available. They lifted up a serpent who was the, catch this guys, who was the image of the consequence of their sin. The snakes were the consequence of their sin. The serpent was the image of the consequence of their sin. And when they looked at it, even God not ritualistically, they were, they were healed. And healing for them meant they didn't die. When he looks at it, he shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and he put it on a pole and so it was if a serpent had bitten anyone... When he looked at the bronze servant, serpent, he lived. He lived. So there was this image, a type and model in the desert. The part that blows me away is you can see, not just through this desert period, 
but through even the kings of Israel. You see this honoring of God, and then abundance comes, and then straying of God, and then usually when a nation strays from God, God allows its arch enemies to rise up in a righteous state and devastate and enslave that nation. Historically, biblically, you can find this is true. And that's why we need to pray over this nation, because we're in a qualifying round right now. And that's not pleasant truth, but that's truth. I wish I could just be happy, clappy, but the reality is, is God has been very good to this nation. And in the abundance of comfort, we've strayed. Prosperity and comfort have been a poison to us. Okay, so we good? We're going to pray for America. Okay, come with me to 1 John chapter, 20, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 29. This is now John the Baptist. He's baptizing people. <coughs> the Pharisees had asked him the day before, are you the one promised? And he said, no. He said, but I'm a forerunner. I'm preparing the way. Okay. And he also said, which is I find very interesting, they recognized the Spirit of God moving in John's life, and John told them because the Pharisees, listen to this, the Pharisees came to John Check this out. This is how dumb sin is. The Pharisee, honestly, sin is, it makes people, I need to be politically correct here. Sin makes people very stupid. It dulls people down. The Pharisees came to John the Baptist just before this segment that I'm reading and said, are you the Christ? Are you the promised Messiah? And he said, no, no. I am the one preparing the way. But the one who you seek is standing among you now. So he literally told them, they saw the markers of heaven, the hallmarks of the, of the hands of God, because they were all looking for the Messiah on John. Enough where they came to him and said, Are you the And John said, no, but the one that you're looking for is here now. Never came to Jesus and said, are you the Christ, the Messiah? They only came when, uh, the only time that was asked is that, is when Caiaphas was saying, are you the Christ? As, as, as you say, and he tore his robe. That's how dumb sin is. Is my microphone still working? So, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, listen to this, listen to this. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What is sin? Missing the mark. What, is, what does sin do? Brings death, consequences of sin. The wages of sin is death, right? The wages of sin is the snake's brings death. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I have said, after me comes one who is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water, and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained on him, and I did not know him, but he who sent me will baptize with water. Sorry, he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, out of the translation say, and with fire. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Now, look at the language here. He said, when he sees Jesus, what does he say? Behold. What does behold mean? Look at Look at, gaze upon the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. What did God say to Moses? Look at, if you get bitten with sin, look at this pole with this bronze and serpent. Behold that thing in faith and you will not die. So John sees Jesus coming and he says, behold, same 
Oh, well. <laughs> Baptized. I, sorry, I need to keep moving here. I can't, I can't let that stop me. John looks at Jesus. I apologize. Coffee's overboard, but it, it is what it is. <laughs> John looks at Jesus, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God slain for the sins of the world. What is he saying? Everyone here, I am pointing the way, but this is the way. And if you look at him, you will not die. Because it's a type and model. With Moses, it was a type. Thank you so much, Whitney. It was a type and model of the condition of man, the condition of sin, the consequence of rebellion and, and wayward straying from God. And God, even in that, when they had literally disrespected God, God had the right to say, I'm just going to let all of you die and I'm going to take your kids. Start over. But even in that, when they came to their senses and repented, God came with mercy. So can I just say this? As long as you're willing to come to your senses, you'll find the mercy of God. It doesn't matter how messed up you become. If you will come to your senses, you will find the mercy of God. But that requires humbling yourself. Hello. Someone catching this right now. Okay. Remember when, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and, and move through this. Remember Peter, when he walked on water, what was he doing? Looking at Jesus. When he looked at Jesus, his world rose above his circumstances. When he looked at Jesus, behold the Lamb of God. Look at the Lamb of God. Focus on. Not focusing on my conditions. We know that when he focused on his sin, it all came apart. Not his sin, sorry. When he focused on the waves and the circumstances, and he respected that more than Jesus, he fell into his circumstances. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> I've been in too much air conditioning the last week. <clears throat> But when he looked at Jesus, he was above. So there's something about having a perspective of looking at Jesus rather than visiting him from time to time. And there's also some good lessons on not letting God take you into a moment of breakthrough and success and then discarding him and ending up with snakes biting you and blaming leaders and God and all the things that we do when we just let our old nature go wild. Hello. Then we see, I'm just going to progress here real quick. We see that Jesus himself, as was prophesied, was nailed to a tree and lifted up. And what happened? Everyone looked at him while he hung there. Behold, the Lamb of God. Who takes away the sin of the world? What happened? Blood and water flowed. Redemption. See, this whole story is about someone being lifted up on a, on, a, on a tree. But it's not enough for him to be lifted up on a tree if I'm not fixated on him. Because just because it's lifted up doesn't mean that everyone gets redeemed. It's he who focuses on the Lamb of God. Okay, we good? You tracking? If I could just say this, a lot of the times in our lives, and we really try and encourage around this because, because we do speak very apostolically here, it's very motivational, it's very let's go, it's mobilization, that sometimes you can grab a hold of that and you can implement it with a militant striving. And then we end up burning out trying to be something. But you know, we're not speaking from a place of let's go strive. We're speaking from a place of, no, let's go do this out of a place of looking at. So I don't strive to look like I'm doing well. I look at Jesus and I live out of a response of constantly, daily looking at Jesus, listening to Jesus. See, from that place, I can live fierce and tenaciously and intensely. But if I try and live fierce, tenacious and intense out of a place of disconnect, it's just going to be religious striving that will burn out. But if I look at Jesus, I can stay in a place of intensity as a response, like I've been plugged into a mainframe power grid. And it's genuine. So at this point, you're either crazy or you're legitimate. If I'm looking at Jesus, I'm operating out of a power source that's not my own. Hello. So I just want to make that really clear. We're not striving to exist. We're looking to Jesus. Most important thing you need to hear in the balance of what we're talking about. Last scripture. Hebrews 12, verse 1. 
Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. I've preached about this before. We'll preach about it again another time. But there's a difference between the overt sin and the stuff that's not defined as sin, but the stuff that's going to slow you down. The stuff that looks good, but it wasn't God's plan. It's not sin, but it's not the perfect will of God. That's going to slow you down. Your good ideas might slow you down. If you're not looking at Jesus, you're not going to see what he's doing over your life. And so you can end up actually counter-opposing him with your ideas, your dreams, your ambitions, your thoughts, your ideas, your wisdom, where you actually are fighting him and striving against his will over your life. So when we put all that stuff down and we look at Jesus, we start to see where he's walking and we can follow him. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. And that really, for me, I've been out in the middle of nowhere, middle, you know, snowing, freezing cold. I'm, you know, hours away from civilization, maybe days in some cases. And some of those places, it's so dark and so cold that you don't have the luxury of all the lights, especially if it's clouded over and it's very dark. You can't just like turn a light on and walk around freely. You have to have headlights and flashlights and you need to walk very carefully so you can't just like look and like run. You've got to walk and you have to shine on every step you're taking because if you step in the wrong place in the middle of nowhere in sub-freezing temperatures and no one knows where you are, this has happened to me several times. I've been out hunting and things like that and you hunt late and it gets dark. You could twist an ankle or break a leg or fall off something or fall into a hole or a crevice and no one's going to know you're there and now you're in serious trouble. So you, you, if you start moving around in those types of environments with kind of like an overt arrogance of just like everything's great, leadly dee, leadly do, you can end up in a lot of problems. So what you have to do is instead of just having this assumptive kind of free-for-all, you actually have to start focusing and really paying attention what I have to do is I have to look down here, look where I'm walking, and then I flash the light up higher to see that I'm still in the same direction. Then I come back down and I make sure. You see, it starts to become more of a dependent walk. I start having to be more cautious in the way that I'm navigating rather than just aloofly walking. Wait till you have a big set of bear's eyes and you see it stand up in the distance and all you can see is its eyes. I'm telling you, you're going to get right with God real quick. That's happened to me up in Colorado at 12,000 feet, and it's not a great experience. I did have a gun, though. <laughs> I was going to have a bear. I was going to have a bear coat. So, anyways, <laughs> let's keep reading. Enough side stories. So, let us lay aside the weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race set before us. Can I just say this? In every race, the runners don't mark out the course. There is no, there is no legitimate race. I'm not talking about you running after work. I'm talking about like a legitimate race where the runners mark out the course. We'll just run wherever you want. Hopefully it all works out. No, no, you have to run the course that the, that the organizers have put together. <laughs> i got a funny story, but I don't have time for it, so we'll tell you another time. It was about me doing cross-country when I was younger, and it's pretty trashed. But anyways, <laughs> it's a good story. So re someone remind me, and I'll tell that story another time. I've got to tell it very politically correct these days, too. Times have changed. Anyways, from, from when I was young. So, so <laughs> looking under Jesus, the author and finisher. So I have, to, I have to run the race with endurance. How? Looking. Behold the Lamb. Looking under Jesus, the author, he, he designed the race course, and he's standing at the finish line, so you can't come into this kingdom any other way but through me. So what I have to do is I have to constantly look to Jesus who authored my life. There's people out there that say, just do whatever you want. We've talked about it before. There's whole groups of people. Just do whatever you want. God's creative. He wants you to be creative. Just do whatever you want, and you're going to wind up, and he's going to be so proud of you. That's not true. He's the author and the finisher. Jeremiah 29, 11 also contradicts that belief system, that he has plans and thoughts and a blueprint and a course of your life, and it's our job as kings and priests to discover that and walk in in obedience. Because God has intricately put all of our lives together to fulfill saving the world. So we look under Jesus, the author and finisher. Do you see a track record here? 
constantly not my, my, not my perspective, not my will, yours be done. None of these things. Not my opinion, not my preference, not my comfort. Looking to Jesus, even when there's been a great victory and now God is testing you or he's walking you towards purpose through difficulty, through loneliness, through abandonment, through hardship. It's not fear. Yeah, but maybe it isn't. Maybe it's not fear that you're about to get so blessed if you keep your mouth shut. Absolutely. I just learned that I just need to be quiet on a lot of stuff. Because little old me is not actually all that wise in the future. I got prophetic glimpses, but I don't have prophetic perspective. Only God has perfect perspective of what tomorrow looks like, not me. I have glimpses. I have inklings. I have unctions. I have promises. So my job is to keep quiet when I want to complain and not end up judged. Not end up killing my seed. Hello. That's like giving. Giving's the same. When we give, we have a victory one moment. Next thing you know, whoa, I can't pay my bills now. Be quiet. Be quiet. Please be quiet because you're about to destroy the breakthrough that you were just sowing for. That's the time to be quiet. Because our grumbling, and you can read it, the, the children of Israel constantly angered God because they grumbled against him. Hello. So looking under Jesus. Anyone who looks upon that brazen serpent will be healed. Behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He's the sin eater. He's the healer. He's the deliverer. He's the author of your life. And he will finish it and crown you with glory. Crown you with blessing. Crown you with inheritance. Crown you with eternity. Crown you with sonship. Crown you with purpose, fulfillment. And honestly, crown you with identity. So we cast off all these other things. Let's just stand to our feet. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. I really felt like God wanted me to share this topic tonight. Because sometimes it's so easy to lose perspective and get distracted and even complain and grumble. And then we wonder why seasons die. And, and seasons get elongated and promises get delayed or all of a sudden, why has all this chaos entered my life? Well, it's not always the devil. Sometimes we've invited it in by what we've said it out, of our, out of our mouths. Attacking God, doubting his promises, becoming, you know, we become that kid that has to get dragged to school, you know? Don't be that kid. There's just some things that God's going to ask you to do that aren't easy. There's some tasks that just are monotonous and painful Find joy in being obedient. Don't define your decision to be joyful in based on your comfort. Otherwise, you're going to sabotage your season and you're going to sabotage your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you that even though in our brokenness, while we were still lost, Jesus died for us. That you became hope for us in the midst of our hopelessness. And so, Father, tonight, we honor you. We repent right now, God, for all the grumbling that we've ever done. Come on, some of us just need to put some stuff right. For all the areas that we have just been sabotaging our lives and our destiny and our trajectory, for where we've dishonored you, we've dishonored leaders, that's caused you to be angry. And we understand that Jesus became grace and mercy over our lives, but at the same time, we never want to be abusers of grace and mercy. Where... We despise the manner you've given us in the season. It might not be what we're hoping for, but at least it's something, and you're doing something in a season that's preparing us and shaping us. And so right now, Father, we ask for mercy. We ask for forgiveness. We repent. Come on, just tell them, I repent. I'm sorry I ask you to forgive me, and that you would wash me, and that you would create in me a pure heart, a clean heart, and you'd renew a right spirit in us, God. We ask you that you'd forgive us for every word of doubt and bitterness and mumbling that we've ever had, groaning, complaining, that you'd forgive us, God, and that Holy Spirit, that you would just implant in us a, a, a guard at our mouths and our minds, that we would not allow our hearts to be embittered against you, but we would walk in humility and we would walk in trust, knowing that if we, if we just follow you, that you are going to lead us into greatness, breakthrough, provision, blessing, healing, abundance, and purpose. 
In Jesus' name, we bless you, Father. And we thank you for tonight. I steal these words in every spirit, every mind, every heart. And I pray that, we, that you would raise the bar of conviction over our lives, that we would walk in greater holiness and obedience with you and for you, and that you would bring us into purpose because we know that it's your delight to give us the kingdom. So we bless you tonight, Father, and we thank you that you've been so gracious and kind to us, that you're so patient with us in all of our learning and our struggles and getting it wrong, that your, your kindness and your grace is so abundant over us. So we bless you and we thank you that this next season is going to be a great season as we walk in obedience, humility, and purity. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. 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 We love you guys. This is awesome. We are working on completing the brand change, the name change. We're going to be bringing that soon. You can be expecting to see that very soon. Um, hopefully, by next week, we should have some dates. And uh, lots of cool things coming. Amen. Be blessed, guys. Have a wonderful week. I don't think there's any other announcements. If there are, we'll put them up on socials. But we'll see you next Wednesday. Have a wonderful, blessed week. Trusting God and walking with Him. God bless you guys. Have a good night.